All right, let's go ahead and start. I can give a update about what's going on. We can talk about some next steps and then keep the room open for a little while uh, so that uh, folks that, that can drop by um, will will be able to. All right, so so welcome. This is our FPGA meetup uh, for the, the 16th of April, 2024. And uh, what we do is we talk about what we've done over the past week or so and what we have planned for the next week or so and in the future. And if we need any resources or if we have any roadblocks. Um, and we've been consuming resources and we've been encountering roadblocks, that's for sure. Um, so what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Paul talk about remote labs and if there's anything that the that remote labs needs. Hello, um, remote labs are hanging in there. Uh... We're going to need to do some scheduled uh, downtime sometime soon for software upgrades, uh, but that can be scheduled at convenience. Uh, I'm not aware of any other remote lab report. Okay. Yeah, things have uh, been been working. Uh, thank you. And uh, I've been using uh, all sorts of the equipment. <laughs> so. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, another re so a related remote labs update is that we're we're in the process of uh, reaching out to to IEEE about establishing a second remote labs in the center part of the country, uh, probably Arkansas. So this is the Region Five director that we're that we're talking with. So that's moving forward. Um, the outreach uh, started happening at Opcom in April and uh, early earlier early April, or sorry, March, sorry, wrong month, uh, uh, operations uh, uh, conference from, from IEEE for Region 6, and then the Region 5 director was there. So um, we had met him previously at uh, IWRC, or IWORK, which was a, a, a workforce um, conference for IEEE for chips and FPGAs and ASICs and things. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. There'll be more more about that soon. So plenty of things happening for remote labs. Um, on the FPGA front, we have two articles that are currently uh, being considered for inclusion in QEX magazine from ARRL. One is a Zadoff Chu uh, article just talking about what they are. Um, these sequences are, are now used for, um, for preambles and for synchronization. Uh, they're really cool. And uh, so we're we're happy with the article, and and so far so good. Uh, odds are good it'll get included. And we've also submitted a space frequency block coding article describing what it is, why you care, and how it can be implemented. Um, and that is also uh, in in process. Uh, so there is a small amount of money that you get if you publish with QBX, and that's going to be uh, all donated to to ORI if it happens. Uh, and it's really nice to get uh, articles in front of uh, amateur and uh, citizen science communities and to have, have something published. So that's moving forward. Um, another article about the experiences with the University of Puerto Rico, we're writing it as we go. So um, regardless of, of what, what happens, um, we expect good things. Um, but the whole process of uh, getting the uh, opulent voice uh, link uh, restored and and working and then upgrading, um, moving from from four area FSK to to minimum shift keying, um, all of that's being written down. So we're looking forward to that being an article too. So there's been a in the lab there's been a successful um, HDL coder. That's the that's a toolbox from from MATLAB that changes uh, converts your Simulink model to uh, hardware descriptive language. In our case, we've targeted VHDL, so that's the language that we're converting. So we had a successful HDL coder conversion of Opulent Voice Transmitter. Um, however, this is not not optimized. This is first draft, and everything everything worked well for the conversion, and the the code is very readable. Um, the drawbacks or 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 problems with the code are completely our fault, uh, like naming. So the the blocks that are that are placed, uh, the the names need to be cleaned up because that comes through to the code, and uh, it it could be better. Also, we now see how you can put annotations into the 
the code from from Simulink, so you can annotate with text on the uh, model, and it will show up in your code. That's really kind of nice. Um, so those things are things that we saw with this rough draft, uh, and it's synthesized, which is fantastic. And uh, HDL Coder creates a test bench, which is really good. And the test bench we'll we'll look at later today. But we were able to make it, and it also prepares you some some data files. It looks like as well. So all of that's great to have a template for test bench and HDL coder. However, when we went to do <laughs> implementation, we found out that the uh, the numerically controlled oscillators, there's two of them because uh, you have have those those two sets of, of multiplications in there with a sine and cosine. Um, they're way too big. So they're they're not optimized in any way. This was just get it working in Simulink, convert it with HDL Coder, see what you have. The FPGA in the Pluto is a, a 7010, 7010 uh, Zinc. It's relatively small. Uh, and we swamped out all the lookup tables just with our NCOs. So now we're going back to figure out like, okay, how do we uh, make this less fat? Because um, now we understand the math and, and it looks really pretty. Uh, but trying to reduce the resolution on the NCOs uh, led to some interesting things. So I have a picture that I can show. I'll show you what I mean. It's in preview. Okay, I'm going to try to share this. Okay, so, so here's what you can see. Um, this is from Simulink, so this is their visualizer. And you can see this looks kind of ugly. It doesn't really look like the previous things that we've shared. Um, what's happening is that the NCOs are now running too slow. And in the middle of the three windows is uh, the bitstream, our, our check, a, 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 a essentially a, a, a intermediate result that we use to check, and then the uh, even bit uh, carrier component. All three, and you can sort of see that it looks kind of choppy, and it's getting kind of yoinked with the purple one. The check be you know check even bitstream uh, result is not working right. So oddly, uh, changing the uh, sort of the resolution or the the amount of resources spent on the NCO changed the frequency, and we'll dig into that today and figure that out. But it was kind of an unexpected result, and that's where we're at. So if we can reduce or replace the NCOs with something like a function or a simpler table. You know, there's there's definitely simpler ways to do this than we're uh, actually within reach of putting most of the modulator design onto a chip or into the FPGA and then testing it. So I'll stop sharing that. Um, yeah, so I think the uh, numer numerically controlled oscillators one on strike, maybe I irritated them somehow. Uh, we've got everything parameterized for this so that it should just be a change in the MATLAB script that calls up the Simulink. Um, but it's going to take walking through. Uh, Ken recommended to double the frequency and see if the uh, slip or shear uh, is linear or fixed. Um, yeah. So anyway, look. Look in Slack if you can help out or or redirect us in a better direction um, or help troubleshoot, then that'd be fantastic. All right, and then uh, I think I'll turn it over to, to Ken. You want to tell us how uh, your uh, receiver side work is going or, or, or what you need from here? I actually don't have much to report on that. Uh, it was mostly... Uh, trying to get that uh, Puerto Rico block, uh, the, the OPV, just trying to help you on that, and trying different things. That was most of what I did last week. So, okay. So it sounds like we're we're okay there now. You you were able to solve the solve the issues with that. No, no, we haven't solved the issues with the the block yet. I'm just I'm taking your recommendation from from uh from today and then i'm going to go ahead and like double the frequency and look and see that you know, where the error is coming from so so no i haven't finished oh well, like i sorry i guess with reference to integrating that uh that block on on the dma transfer chain, chain that was a 
Oh, yeah, that's a whole other problem. Okay, so what we did is we hand wrote a small, simple do nothing or do hardly anything block um, in order to to test, uh, you know, because we're doing all this work with with producing the VHDL and actually looking at the design of the transmitter and receiver. Um, okay, so all that's going on, but we also have this reference design for well, we have reference designs for a variety of hardware in our lab, but we went ahead and picked the Pluto. It's relatively small. And when you uh, run make project, it doesn't take hours. It takes minutes. That's as good. Uh, so, and we'd like to use the Pluto for the University of Puerto Rico uh, rocket launch. So yes, the, the there is a separate effort to test um, getting a block into the reference design successfully on the transmitter. And the block does very little except look at whether data it's getting is valid or not. And if it's valid, I think it passes the data or or overwrites it with all ones. And if it's invalid, you know, so it, it just basically says, oh, am I getting valid data from the DMA? If not, then I'm going to overwrite it. Now, this is sort of behavior that we want because if we don't get any valid data from DMA for transmit, we still want to keep track of where we are because that's an underrun to us and, you know, just handle it uh, appropriately and not lose track of, of frame edges or, or, or what have you. So, so we want to put like a really basic block in there and test that we can manipulate the tackle commands that build the reference design and then make the design and create a Vivado project and create the bitstream that goes into the image that goes into the firmware that goes into the Pluto. This has not been successful yet, um, scattered success. So we accidentally succeeded at some point, and now we're stuck. Uh, we can't get it to completely work. The, we're relying on tackle commands that are from analog devices uh, that turn out to be defined in a script in the scripts directory, but don't have any documentation. It's not clear. Um, what the workflow is. And after about a week of back and forth with the customer service at Analog Devices, uh, they confirmed that they have no documentation for any of these commands. So um, we have to figure out how all the other blocks are placed in the reference design and pick and choose and, and try to reverse engineer what they do. It We've gotten pretty far. We accidentally succeeded once so yeah i have some some evidence photographic evidence of our block actually showing up in the reference design but that was not something that we could uh, reliably reproduce um ever east has a successful pluto design with the with our dvb s2 encoder in it and he provided a link to his, his repo which we we know about uh and so going back there and looking and seeing how he did it would be uh, probably really useful at this stage. I think the root cause is that we're not we're not successfully or completely uh, configuring or declaring our pins as uh, interface pins, or BD underscore interface pins. Where that's done in this workflow is not entirely clear. And duplicating uh, some of the other blocks in the reference design, and especially duplicating the behavior of the blocks that we're interposing ourselves between, hasn't worked yet. Uh, so. As soon as we figure it out, we'll fill in even more of the document, the tracking document that we're uh, writing to to show all this. So we're trying to write down all the steps that that are needed in order to say, here's your block. How do you get it into the reference design and get it on the air? And and we've added a lot to that document over the past uh, four days. So, and we sent the document off to customer service and said, what have we got wrong? Um, and we have not gotten, um, uh, we got a, a, a comment that we just failed to uh, to instantiate it correctly. That was it. So, <laughs> so, so far, uh, not a whole lot from customer service, but I'm continuing to try and and ask questions and and we're making some some progress. Um, I think Matthew pointed out that the AXI TDD block had a wrapper that had these commands in it. Um, and so I tried to duplicate that, but didn't get it to work right. Somebody maybe with a little more experience on this might need to, to look at it.
Uh, so, so thanks, Ken, for, for pitching in there too. Um, and thank you, Matthew, for trying to help. As soon as we get a, kind of a handle on it, I think we'll be able to write down a procedure with this command does this particular thing and you need to do this them in this order. And we continue to ask for them to um, to publish the page that they keep pointing to uh, on Engineer Zone that has some additional uh, instructions. Uh, it's 404 and has been a 404 for a while. And maybe that page will will pop up and and it looks like it might uh, might have some some good information on it. I've, I've shared the screenshots. The customer service gave me some screenshots of this page. Um, it, it's a page that that keeps get you keep getting pointed to on Engineer Zone, which is the uh, supposed to be the technical support for ADI. Um, but this page is not accessible. So we got a couple of screenshots, and it looks like it's a little bit more than the page that it's linked from, or the or the page that that has the link uh, to the to this one. Uh, but it's not a workflow or a walkthrough or it doesn't explain the theory of operations for this. Um, and we're not alone. So I've talked to uh, four or five other groups and companies that uh, ran into the same sort of problem and they pretty much just had to reverse engineer it on their own or gave up. So I don't think we should give up. I think we should keep moving forward in that um, once we kind of have a, a workflow you know, a process, here's how you get your block in there that will be in, in much, much better shape. And then we'll start to be able to, to put more blocks in. Um, let's see, the last thing I have is that the, the HDL coder conversion was from, was for the, um, uh, was for the transmitter and it's, uh, or modulator. And it it's from the point where you already have the even and odd bit streams and they're already offset by a bit time. You know, so there's some work that needs to be done be before you you get to this particular. But I thought that was a good place to cut the design and to test out, you know, kind of sort of the back end of the design. Um, and this was this worked out. So it's a subsystem in Simulink. Uh, targets okay. There's no errors. Everything worked. All the work that we've done up to now, you know, made this uh, happen. Um, and and like I said, some of the naming for the blocks and naming for the signals could be a whole lot better. I now see how they pick up names for signals and things like that. So documentation in the Simulink directly affects the quality of the code that you get out of the tool. All right, that's that's what I've got. And I'll I'll turn it over to 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 um turn it over to, to Matthew uh to to speak to all these things and to to tell us uh anything that you'd like to talk about. Uh, and then, then Ken, you can you can pick up after that. If there's anything that you want to talk about for the polyphase filter bank work, or or what you need in order to move forward. I, I um, so in terms of like documentation, I redrew the MSK demodulator, um, and with some annotations. Um, so I don't know. Hopefully, that's helpful. I think it could be further annotated. Um, it's it's there's two papers that have the basically um, the same demodulator, and so I cross reference between the two papers to make sure everything was made sense. Um, I still think you know the the a lot of the blocks kind of have an analog feel to them, even though one of the papers was specifically about implementing it in a DSP. Um, so I, I think it could still be um, improved to be more um, in, in the digital domain or using symbols that are more uh, digital in nature. Um, but I mean, I think it's fine for the moment, uh, but if there's any comments or feedback on it, that would be great. Um, as far as the, the issues with the integration of the blocks into the ADI stuff, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that as I have time. Um, I, I probably, the easiest approach would be the uh, copying the AXI TDD wrapper approach. I know you you tried that, uh, Michelle. Um, but when I get some time, I'll try and look at that as well and see um, if there's anything there that we can move it forward. That might just be, in general, the easiest approach. I looked at several of the other blocks 
like the AXI uh, DMAC block. And, you know, clearly the ports on that block are labeled or have the um, metadata attached to them to make them uh, the block diagram interface pins, ports, or block diagram pins, ports, whatever they are. But it's looking through all the scripts and uh, source for the AXI DMAC block. It's not clear how those are being created, how they're being um, set. So the the wrapper approach in the AXI TDD, I think, is probably our best bet to do something that's fairly repeatable and um, more clear more clear in in what's happening. Um, so I'll, 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 as I get some time, I'll take a look at that as well. Um, and then, uh, I'm just curious on Michelle on the, um, on the NCOs when you're decreasing the resolution, clearly they got slower, which seems to be the problem. Um, so what, what parameters were you changing? Just the frequency or, or the number of bits? Yeah, I didn't intentionally change the frequency, but that's apparently what happened when I went back in and, and measured things and looked at it. Um, and it was on both. So I changed both. I went from 32 bits to 16 bits to see if that would possibly make the the resource consumption go down. Um, I'm surprised. I guess it must be the lookup tables in there that are so large. They are um, pretty big. It's it's a big honk. It's you know, it, I mean, I, it shouldn't be that big. I mean, the NCOs I use are are thirty two bits. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, in fact, you know, I, I've been looking at thinking about implementing them in in a DSP slice, but and then just have a, a simple quarter wave lookup table, um, right, to generate the sign output or the you know the the sinusoid output, you know, and that would be you know really small. I mean, um, yeah. I, th I think you'd probably recognize the problem. When I looked at it, it had a table for sine and a table for cosine, which kind of, I went, oh, that's a, okay. Cause I think you can use one table for, for both. Um, so I think yeah, it you... might be a naive, you know, I mean, when you use uh, automatic conversion, you deal with these issues where it's just a right. naive copy. So it, yeah, it's just brute force. It, it's right. yeah, there's no optimization. Right. So, I mean, I think maybe we should go in and replace those and that might be a thing to do. Um, yeah. And there may be some sort, I mean, maybe I don't understand how to use the NCOs in Simulink. Uh, but all I did, I swear, I, swear, I promise, all I, all I did was I was like, okay, 32 bits is overkill. Let's go to 16 because everything is 16 bit in our design. And, right. you know, when I read the NCO page, it said like, usually you're the bit width of this particular register is the native bit width for your processor. And I was like, okay, that sounds optimized. And I'm thinking later on, not really, because like everything that we have is six. So I changed it and it, um, at first it was completely broken. And then I had to, you know, uh, dial down the dithering. Uh, and I, after I got that under control, then I noticed that there was this weird shear force and it just wanders off into, so it's something that I did and it, it could be, um, it, 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 it could be in the, uh, the calculation for the free, it has to be in the calculation for the frequency somehow. Well, so it could be that it, 16 bits isn't enough. Like, I don't know what the, you'd have to, based on the sample rate, the Delta, the phase Delta within the NCO, right. It, it, it can, it can roll over once, but say if you, if you go to 16 bits, it might be rolling over twice and then uh, the math won't work. So, okay. um, so you, you have to have enough bits to the the number of bits has to be larger than whatever the phase delta is right and so um and the phase delta is you know I, i'm thinking much more of a digital implementation versus whatever's happening in simulink um but it, I'm, I'm thinking that you may 16 bits may not be enough and it and it's not related to lookup table as much as it is it's related to um just the the math of the rollovers, right? Because um, in the NCOs that I've worked with and designed, it's just a basically an accumulation register, and you add the the phase delta every clock, and your um you get a rollover that's your effectively your your whatever clock you're generating, but and you also have a phase output, and the phase output can go through a lookup table to create a sinusoid. 
but the the it's just a linear phase within the NCO itself, typically, at least what I've worked with. So yeah, um, I mean, at least so visually, it, it looks like there's plenty of resolution even at 16 bits, but that could be that could be fake. So it could be yeah, I mean, the, be the, fooling the, me. Given it's a little hard to tell because, but I mean, you have those sharp transitions that that were yeah. happening. And it's definitely being cut off, and the the frequency is wrong. I mean, but the resolution of the waveform is still pretty much overkill. Yeah, I think the re the resolution's fine. I I think, like I said, it, it might be based on the whatever the the core sample rate is. Um, you know, the the formula is two, uh, whatever your your frequency that you want, um, divided by the sample rate times the two, the bit width, two to the bit width, is 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 your phase delta and so that your you just need to make sure that your number of bits is greater than that you know phase delta so that you ensure you only have one rollover per clock right yeah I mean, if you if you if you narrow it down you're gonna you're gonna roll over every clock which is okay um but the the but if you roll over say two times in one clock i think that's going to be a problem so Okay, yeah, I'll double check I, that because I could have easily tromped over that in updating yeah, the, it's certainly the block. Not something that's uh, I want to say obvious, right? And it probably you know they they may not really address that in the. I don't know how good the documentation is. In, in <laughs> well, the NGO, it's, right? <laughs> that's a very diplomatic way to say it. It's 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 mathy. I'll tell you that it's yeah. it's not a. Not very digitally, but uh, okay. I'll I'll look to that and and um and double check it and and hopefully we'll have some some good results today uh, after the rest of the meetings. Um, yeah, thank you. That that makes a lot of sense. And uh, so yeah, I mean, we might want to replace these with our own design, like our own thing, and we can, yeah. um, you know. Uh, but it was really nice to see it. Just it worked. Uh, the conversion worked and the the code is 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 pretty good and uh, it put in some clock enables which is cool uh that was neat but we don't have clock enables on any other blocks in the library um so it and i don't know i don't know where it decides to to do that sort of thing that might be a default somewhere um and i can't really think of anything else all the other stuff looked very straightforward like when i when i looked through the the listings they were not uh obfuscated um or or ugly you know um it's really it, it 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 was very reinforced to me that you know it can produce uh useful code uh it's not a a big bang it can't read your mind it's just like uh you know other automatic things like ai ml or you know trying to use chat gpt for code you really have to pick through and modify it um and you have an awful lot of control over the naming, which is that's always been important to me to, to have really good recognizable names. And I now see where it can be improved. So that's one of the things that will get folded in. But yeah, so. it seems like it's really good for prototyping, for quickly trying out ideas. But yeah, it is. The <laughs> learning curve is still pretty, pretty hard, but like all this stuff really is. But yeah, for prototyping and getting things out, uh, once you kind of get, the levers you get it under your fingers it's uh it's not bad uh and i i still haven't really looked very closely at the test bench but if it saves me time in writing test benches i'm very happy about that because that's where i spend a huge amount of time uh, trying to get things to work really well and i have my own like way that i like to do test benches so i'm excited about seeing what it what it has as a template um it'll be interesting but um what are you using them? Just curious for test benches. For, for me? Yeah. Oh, what I usually do is it's very boring and basic. So I have uh, text files with the stimulus mm -hmm. and then just very, it's very brute forcey. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, this is all in Vivado that, or whatever tool I'm required to use uh, at, at whatever work site, but it's uh, as, as simple as possible. Um, but I have like a, a recipe that works and like, how do you set up the text files? How do you open them? How do you manipulate them? And then I write everything very pedantically out to a text file just so I have a backup. 
Um, and I've used model sim before in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know that there's a couple of other versions, uh, you know, but my, you know, the way that I do it is like really pretty, pretty basic. Yeah. Um, so that's how, that's how I achieve it. So I'm curious as to see like, what is it doing since it, HDL coder is aware that this is targeted for Vivado. Um, I'm I'm curious to see if it'll be, you know, uh, as as plain as the as the source code is. So the VHDL is very very clear and plain. So I'm curious to see how the the test bench comes out. So mm -hmm. okay. it's all uploaded on the repo, uh, so anybody can go look at it. And then I I went ahead and opened everything in Vivado, made a project, it passed synthesis, it failed implementation. And so I exported the that project and also put it in the repository as well. So any anything that that gets done will be pushed up there so that people have a, a copy of it that's not just sitting on Karapi. So it's it's been good. This is this is good steps forward. Um just as usual, the things that are hard or that are kind of unexpected, it's but they're you know, like the tools and the and implementations. And then the things that you think might be the hardest part um, actually have turned out to be okay. <laughs> so, so it's uh, the usual, usual way that things go. Hopefully this will be a good demo. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't work until it works over the air. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting this into a, you know, into, into a build and, and getting it on a SDR. I'm a little concerned, like the implementation failed with just this small project on Pluto. So, uh, you know, to fit in the entire HDL reference design and also what we're doing, it's going to have to be uh, a lot smaller, you know. Um, so some, something something went, you know, went awry in the implementation and we'll we'll figure it out. All right. Any uh, any other questions or or resources needed or or uh, anything I'm missing? Not a lot of not a lot of FP, FPGA activity on on Neptune. Um, we do owe um, we do owe Neptune an update for the resettable sample and hold. So we did figure out how to do that, um, and that's a MATLAB function. And I, I'm going to have it as a standalone. I'm going to convert that over and, and then see how it looks in, in VHDL. Um, but we 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 need to go back over and and update the uh, the sample and hold MATLAB function in, in the Neptune design because it uses like four of them. And we found a bug working on, on Opulent Voice. Um, the way that, that MATLAB functions are are used in Simulink is really pretty cool. So you drop down a little block that's a MATLAB function, you click on it, and then there you go, you have a little teeny text editor. Um, and then you enter in your function and then the function works. So we do fun we use functions for the resettable sample and hold and for the space frequency block coding um, and so on. But like, where is that text? So I couldn't find it right off the bat, I'm like, so it'd be great to have like those functions clearly accessible and visible. So I made a MATLAB file off to the side, like a like in the directory. But then you have a separate file. It's not so if you make updates in your block and forget to update the code, then you have a mismatch. So I've been asking around, and there isn't really a standard way on sharing the MATLAB functions except as a separate .m file. Um, so maybe we should figure out how to expose those or or who knows maybe the simulink model is I mean, there got to be somewhere in the simulink model the 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 text file has to be in there somewhere um but i guess i was expecting to see it in the directory structure um as a subdirectory or something like that um so anyway we need to update the sample and hold to make sure that the the weird bug that we found does not happen to neptune um and that's a that's I think that's it i think that's all i know about anybody Anybody got anything else? All right, everybody. Good thank years. you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. And see you on Slack and uh, throughout the week.